Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you, Diana, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm just wondering if everyone can just help me out here by um, maybe a few of you can turn on your screen. It's pretty hard to present. You kind of feel like you're having a mental health breakdown when you're talking and there's nobody there you're talking to. <laughs> So I'm wondering if somebody could just help me out a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see your beautiful face. It's a woman empowerment. And even if your hair is not comb and you are still in your pajamas and you haven't cleaned up, uh, it's quite okay. Amen. If you're having one of those um, Don King moments, it's quite okay. Just turn your camera on. We want to see your beautiful face. Uh, so I, I want to throw out a little bit of a disclaimer. It's interesting because um, I went to Taiwan in November to present at a conference. And I went there, flew to Hong Kong, presented at the conference, slept the whole night, got up, presented, came back. But last night I was, I couldn't sleep thinking about this. And then uh, I woke up at quarter to six or quarter to five and finally fell back asleep and had this nightmare that Dan Diana and I went skateboarding at a university and we skateboarded for so long we missed the conference. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's a crazy dream. What is that about? And I realized it's because I think, you know, technology is always working hard to mess with your confidence. And I realize it's the Zoom anxiety that I'm feeling. So uh, if you have your cameras on, then I realize that you're just, just there and we're just going to share um, this morning. So thank you. Diana was very kind in calling me an expert. I don't really see myself as an expert in anything. I think there's uh, so much to learn. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to walk alongside women who've experienced violence in children, um, but I certainly don't consider my, myself an expert in any way, shape or form, but hope to share some things with you this morning uh, that either you will find helpful or you may find helpful for, for somebody else along your way. So of course this presentation is about um, domestic violence and I didn't want to throw up domestic violence across the screen because I know then a lot of people would accidentally get disconnected, you know how that goes, right? So I thought I would give it a different name and I, I, the name that came to me was Phoenix. And um, if you are familiar, um, let me just set a timer here because I believe blessed are the brief. They may be invited to speak again. So let me just set a timer here so that I know when I'm done. Um, if you know the myth about the phoenix, the phoenix is uh, a mythical creature who is said to um, its predecessor, it has died. And while it's um, burning, it's on the funeral prior, that it actually rises again from the ashes. And so this is, this is why I, I thought about using this term in terms of uh, talking about domestic violence because I've worked in this area for about 35 years or so. I know I may not look it, but I have 35 years I've worked in this area. And um, I've seen the strength of women that is unbelievable. I have seen what they've been able to recover from and not just um, recover, but thrive. And, I'm just always amazed at that. I've worked in women's shelters and developed programs and, and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm always amazed. I'm always just in awe of what I see. And I try to go to all the college and university graduations. When they graduate, they always tend to invite me. And when they, I always say to them, walk slowly across the stage. Don't hurry, take your two minutes. And I shout and scream like I'm a mad woman because I'm so proud. I'm just always so thrilled to see that. So this is why uh, I came up with this thought of, of Phoenix. So in talking about domestic violence, um, there are different types of abuse and violence. And I'm gonna be very quick and I'm just gonna hit some of the high points. And for whatever reason, some of the screen is blocking my notes, but it doesn't really matter. Um, when we talk about violence. I'm just going to put all of these up so you can read them yourself. 
not all abuse, of course, is physical. And we know that most abuse in my experience has not, not been physical. Uh, although we know that 51% of women over the age of 16 has had at least one incident of physical or sexual violence. So if there's 54 of us on this line, uh, the quick math is that half of us have had some experience along this line, which is a little frightening. Many women though have told me that uh, emotional abuse and psychological abuse is actually more damaging to them than physical abuse because, you know, the broken arm will heal, the bruises from the black eye will heal. But the damage that is done uh, to your self-worth, to your sense of personal value, to your sense of uh, who you are, it could take a lot longer to heal. And there's often a progression of violence, not always from emotional um, uh, to physical and so on. So when we're talking about emotional abuse, we're talking about things like withholding affection. We're talking about humiliation or constant criticism, blaming or, or scapegoating, um, feelings of um, alienation from your family, being called selfish or inconsistent, um, being ridiculed or dismissed, um, obs obsessive blaming. All of us can take a little bit of uh, criticism, but obsessive blaming starts to um, land on, on, on emotional abuse. When we talk about psychological abuse, we're talking about a person's attempt to frighten, uh, crazy making behavior, um, things that are done specifically to make you feel like you are crazy. And if some of you are as old as I am, you may remember this 1970s movie called Gaslight. And so there is something called gaslighting and it refers to a specific type of manipulation where the manipulator is trying to get you to question your own reality memory or perception. Let me give you an example. Um, I work with a woman that her husband and her son was trying to drive her crazy. And in fact, I think they pretty much succeeded. So they would um, go down into the basement and make a lot of noise and she would become afraid and she would call the police and they would sneak out the window, the basement window. So the police would come and there'd be nobody down there. So the police would go away and then they would sneak back into the wind downstairs, make a whole lot of noise and she'd call the police again. And the police would go down there and there's nobody there. And so that's the kind of like crazy making that after a while you start to wonder, like, are you hearing things? Are you not hearing things? Uh, that's kind of the crazy making behavior when we talk about psychological abuse that sometimes happen. Or gaslighting, you know, uh, abusers will sometimes move things around the house and the behavior is deliberate. I've worked with men who are abusive, who are and I, I, I just want to put a disclaimer out here. I know that women could be abusive too, and men face abuse also. But 79% of the victims are female. So I just want to put that out there that I know that women can be abusive, and I know that men also uh, suffer domestic violence. So I just want to put that out there. So if you hear me using this um, gender lens, it's probably because I'm talking about the, the dominant um, experience. But you will, you will see those things where people uh, it wasn't that bad. I, I, I didn't knock you down. You only fell, right? We hear that a lot of the times. You fell down the stairs. I didn't push you down the stairs. And, you know, we may think that, I hear a lot of women say, you know, I'm really strong. Somebody wouldn't be able to convince me of that. People wouldn't be able to convince me of that. But I want you to think about this for a little while. You get dressed. You wear the best clothes you have on. You, you know, as women, we want to get dressed. We want to look good. We go out. And we go to a dinner, we go to a, a wedding, um, or we go to a party and we think we look good, right? We think we look really, really good. But throughout the evening, you hear these comments about, my God, I can't believe she wore that. Or doesn't she look like the Pillsbury Dole Lady in that? Or I can't believe she has that on. Now, when you left home, you thought you looked pretty good. But if you hear that throughout the night, now you may say it doesn't bother you, but I bet you the next time you go to put that dress on, you're gonna think twice. You're probably gonna think twice. So what I'm saying is that we're all susceptible to uh, impact from people's words, even though we say, well, I'm too strong for this, uh, this wouldn't happen to me. Domestic violence doesn't happen to people because they're weak. It, and we want to talk about that a little bit later on. When we talk about verbal abuse, we're talking um, name calling, condescension. Let me break this down a bit so even you can understand. Harsh, persistent, degradation, 
Uh, if you leave me, nobody else will ever want you. You're nothing. I found you when you were nothing. Um, things blaming. I, I hate hitting you, but you push me over the edge. You provoke me. Those kind of things. The intent of verbal abuse is to belittle you so you lose your sense of self-worth and value. It also makes it easier for them to move from physical abuse, uh, move from psychological verbal abuse to physical abuse. Because after all, they're not, uh, they're not abusing Shannon or Mary, they're abusing a slut, they're abusing a bitch, they're abusing a stupid woman, a whore. So they, de they degrade you so that it's easier uh, than to move into the, the assault. Uh, it helps them to experience um, more comfort and less guilt in, in assaulting you. So really important around that sexual abuse. And this we see quite a bit with physical abuse, forcing people into sexual activity they are not comfortable with, sort of like swinging. Uh, most of you guys are familiar with swinging, you know, switch partners, forcing you to either engage in pornography or viewing or creating it or withholding sex as a, as a way of punishment. And one of the things that we have to be aware of in Canada, I know that there's people from all over uh, the world that's watching this, but in 1983, the Canadian sexual assault law was amended to include sexual assault against a spouse as a chargeable offense. So from 1983, you can actually charge your spouse with, uh, with sexual assault. Financial, and you know, Diana spoke about that. What we see a lot of the times, women who have great jobs, uh, but they have no control of the money or they're not allowed to work um, controlling your earnings without your consent preve preventing you from from gainful employment or things like um, i worked with an, a woman early in my career where she was given a list of the things that she needed to buy and the exact amount of money now if you've shopped you know that today things are 56 cents tomorrow it's a dollar ten you have no idea and if she did not get everything on the list or ran out of money, he would assault her. So you see how you're in a no-win situation. Or um, what we've also seen is the woman who, she wasn't permitted to work, otherwise he would beat her up. And she was not allowed to buy anything that belonged to her. So, um, or, or she needed, she had to um, buy secondhand underwear and secondhand bras because they were cheaper. I didn't even know they sold those things. And also um, even like tampons or pads or anything like that, personal hygiene stuff, she wasn't permitted to buy any of that. She had to use toilet paper. So that's the extent of some, some of the things that we see. And we see women who, especially in Alberta here, it's an oil and gas town. A lot of women are at the head of their game and they may have very powerful, um, great jobs that pay them a lot, but they have no control of the money, financial. Spiritual abuse, preventing you from practicing your faith making fun of spiritual beliefs or, and we see this a lot happen in churches and faith community, uh, misusing or misinterpreting sacred texts as a means of excusing their behavior. And then saying things like, uh, you will go to hell if you leave me. Uh, you will cause me to go to hell if you leave me. Uh, you're supposed to be submissive. And then they have a definition of submissive that doesn't really line up with the sacred text. I'm the head of the household. The Bible says you must forgive me or you won't get forgiveness. So, you know, I'm, I'm from a Christian perspective. So that's the, the position that, that I'm most familiar with me. And so they use the sacred text as a way to uh, explain away their behavior or control the person. And that is not uh, what those sacred texts are meant for. So they will define submissive way in a way that gives them a lot of power. Uh, we see people who come for counseling. I have seen pastor's wives. Uh, apostolic pastors' wives. I've seen uh, people from all faith and, and no faith um, where there is some kind of sacred text or some religious belief that is used to control uh, the person. Um, I've seen, for instance, in, even in a Christian faith where the man may be addicted to prostitution and he comes and says, you have to forgive me. You have to forgive me because the Bible says you must forgive me. And so he just continues this behavior. And oftentimes when you're doing some counseling, you have to look at um, enabling people. And are you in fact enabling somebody? And then of course, physical abuse, which um, one of the things that we know, and we're very familiar with, with what that could look like, um, broken arms, broken bones, uh, black eyes. When I worked at the other shelter, we used to keep um, yellow makeup. And people would say, why would you keep yellow makeup? Nobody wears it because it covers black eyes really well, right? 
And so we would keep yellow makeup uh, for the physical assault. A slap. Sometimes I remember this one gentleman said, I only hit her lightly. I don't know what hitting somebody lightly looks like. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. A slap across the face, uh, a push, a shove, any of those things are considered uh, abuse and violence. And it's, it's really important for us to recognize that. When we look at the cycle of violence, um, we look at attention phase, and this was developed by Lenore Walker. Many of you may be familiar with that. Uh, where tension is built in, he shows more and more anger uh, and violent behavior, and <clears throat> oftentimes the woman is afraid. And again, it could be reversed, where it is the woman that's, that's abusive, but most of the time we see that it is the male in the relationship, and, and she's afraid as a result of that. Then there's an explosion. Something happens that there is an explosion where uh, there's pain, there's fear, there's humiliation, there is despair. Uh, there's something happened in the relationship where there's often an explosion. And these cycles can be one day, it could be 10 minutes. Um, one of the, I worked with this gentleman who was a very scary guy, very, very scary guy. And his family had left, they'd had to go through the program where they went into hiding, changed their names, changed their kids' names, changed everybody's name, because he was quite violent, violent, violent. And the police were saying, as much as we try, he goes to jail, he comes back, he goes to jail, he comes back. And he, uh, so she changed her name, they changed her name, they went into hiding, the police helped them to go into hiding. And he went into counseling <clears throat> and did really well. He did, the light bulb went off, he got it, he did really well. And so he did a video for us. And he said it's something that riveted in my mind. He said, they keep wondering, referring to the wives, his wives and women, he said, they keep wondering what they do to provoke this. He says, they keep wondering what they do to provoke this. And they don't understand the answer is nothing. They don't understand they're not doing anything to provoke this. That our behavior is choice. And that was really, I mean, I always knew that theoretically, but to hear this man say that, he said, we, we get stopped, right? This is not an anger management issue. We get stopped by the police. We don't beat up the police as mad as we are. And we get disciplined at work. We don't beat up our boss as mad as we are because we know there's consequences, but still in our society, the home is somehow sacred and there's permission for this kind of behavior. And when he said that, they keep wondering what they're doing to provoke this. And the answer is nothing. They're actually doing nothing to provoke this. Then there's a denial phase where uh, he makes excuses. He minimized what he did. If only you hadn't done this for me. And we see this also, because not every family in Canada is like, you know, a man, a woman, uh, uh, two kids and a dog named Spot. Like there's multi-generational that live in homes, especially some of the Middle Eastern homes where grandparents live there. Uh, women often are at the bottom of the totem pole. So sometimes the abuse is from the, mother, the husband's mother to the husband's wife. And I don't have a lot of time to get into that, but families don't look traditional as they look anymore. But oftentimes there's a denial. Uh, it's not that bad. I'm so sorry I did it. Um, all that happens. And then there's a honeymoon phase. And one of the things we stopped doing at the shelter, we stopped accepting flowers because the flowers would pour in, I'm sorry, this will never happen again. Um, and when the person says that, they're not really fooling you. They're not trying to um, make you believe something. That's not what's happening. They're actually sorry. They actually are promising that this will never happen again. They're not just trying to pull your leg and get you to go home. But what we often see <clears throat> is unless there's an intervention, either through God or man, the cycle will continue. It will just continue unless either um, and I don't want to frighten people, but unless either the woman dies, uh, the male dies, um, he's charged, or God somehow intervenes and the light bulb goes off. And as a Christian, I believe that will happen. But one of the things that we have to make sure is uh, there's a scripture that we talk about is that people have to bring forth fruit that demonstrate repentance. Saying you're sorry is not really repentance. <laughs> and so um, this will just keep going round and round and round and round. Um, if there's no external intervention. There is nothing that this woman can do to stop this cycle. 
There's absolutely nothing. And sometimes when we slow down things, people will say he just exploded. Uh, I didn't see it coming. But in counseling, when we slow things down, there's often warning signs uh, when we try to um, do a safety plan with women. How prevalent is this issue? Every race, every ethnic, culture, religious, socioeconomic boundaries, it's there. In 2018, which is the most recent stats can uh, domestic violence, uh, there were 99,000 in Canada. So if you're not in Canada, this may not pertain to you, reported police incident. And one of the things that we know is that a woman will be assaulted a mix, a minute, um, an average of 10 times before she calls the police. So if you think about 99,000 are reported and they're assaulted an average of 10 times before they call the police, you know this number is exponential. These are police reported. And uh, for those that are our sisters in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan has the highest rate of domestic violence in Canada. Very high rate. And of course, eight out of the 10, 79% of them are, are women. Um, there's lots of things that are, are, are available. But one of the things that we do know is that for many women, their home is the least safe place. They're actually safer on the streets, which is... Uh, not something that we, we want to think lightly of. And every six days in Canada, a woman is killed by her partner or ex-partner. One of the things, you know, sometimes women, we, we say things like, well, if that happened to me, I would just leave. Trust me. You have no idea you, what you would do if this happened to you. We, we say that, and it's easy to say that. But, you know, if somebody slapped you on the first date, there probably wouldn't be a second, Right. If somebody assaulted you the, on, your, on your, the morning of your wedding day, there probably wouldn't have been a, a marriage. So to say that you would just get up and leave is to really minimize the difficulty that is inherent in, in getting out of an abusive relationship. And again, time doesn't prevent us from doing that. Uh, right now, in, two, in 2019, Al Alberta shelters um, 60,000 crisis calls from women needing to escape. That's how many calls we've got, 60,000. So if there's 99,000 reported to the police in all of Canada, we can only imagine how many people are looking for help. This is of epidemic proportion. Diane had asked me to talk a little bit about how the pandemic uh, would affect families. These stay-at-home orders and our shelter-in-place orders are not good. <laughs> whatever, it's not good in terms of families that are experiencing violence. Because whatever was cracked before COVID broke during COVID. Women are basically under siege for 24 seven. Therefore, there's very little opportunity to call for help. In countries that are further ahead, what we have noticed like Asia, there's a global network of women shelters. So I'm in contact with those women that are in Asia and China, Hong Kong, Taiwan. And what we have seen is that there's an exponential increase as the community begins to open up. And that's because families, uh, women are, are, are now have the opportunity to call to reach out for help because during that time they were under siege. In some countries like Malaysia and France, there was a 32% increase. So quite likely we're about to uh, experience something that's very, very similar. And we saw that happen in Alberta. There was a, a flood in, in um, Northern Alberta and we saw just this exponential increase that happened here. What we do know is that during COVID, and COVID is not over, there was a 221% increase in internet searches related to domestic violence. So lots of people, 221% increase, were looking for information in regards to that. How do we cope through this? And again, this information may not be for you, but it may be for something and I say, you, you might be shut in, but not shut down. So important to do this. One of the things you want to do is create a safety plan. And it's very basic uh, to be able to do that. If you don't, you probably may not know how to do that. But how do you, a safety plan is basically, how do you remain as safe as possible in an unsafe situation? And it's things like, if you're being assaulted, don't go into a bathroom because there's lots of places to fall or be pushed down and hit your head and die. Don't go into a kitchen. There's lots of weapons that are in the kitchen. How do you recognize when things are going sideways? He walks through the door and he kicks the door shut. 
you pay attention to things like that. Things like what you need to do in creating a safety plan. Explore options for emergency housing. And I know there's lots of the times we have friends that we want to run to. And it's great that you want to help out your friend. But you do create a bit of a risk for yourself by having someone who is experiencing violence stay at your house. Because what I have seen in my career is that the, the spouse has been killed along with the friend they're staying with. So you want to help them, but you want to also help them to find a place that has the security. One of the things I talk about the, the organization that I work at right now, we say it's like Fort Knox without the gold, as most charities are, there ain't no money. Um, but there's all kinds of security. There's 24 hour security, there's cameras everywhere. Uh, and it's because there is a reason for that. People try to break in. Uh, people have ran their car through the front door of a shelter with a note from their psychiatrist saying, please surrender this man's wife to him. It's not a jail, the door opens from the inside, right? So it's really important that you really think about your own safety, maybe to, in terms of supporting them uh, and point them to areas if they're, you know, calling 911 and go to a place that is going to be safe and, and you can find other ways because there's a danger to yourself also. And I wanna say for people of faith, because sometimes I think church folks think this isn't happening and uh, it's happening in our, in our pews, it's happening behind our pulpits, it is happening. Uh, at the same rate. So we just want to, I want to put that out there. Keep important documents together in case you have to grab and run. One of the things I say, if you do leave to go to a shelter or a friend's place or wherever you go, do not, do not, do not, absolutely do not go back to the house by yourself to get important documents. You can replace a lot of these things. You cannot replace your life. In my work, I have lost two, two clients. I've, had, I've lost two clients in 34 years, which is too, too many, which is too, too many. And one girl, she, we had told her, don't go back. Uh, she was 20, 28 year old, two little kids. Do not go back, get a police escort. You can, you can get everything else, don't go back. She left, went out, we didn't know. Uh, she did not get the police escort, she went in. He did not go to work as he was supposed to. What we find in Calgary a lot is that these, the men would ride the C train up and down all day because if you don't drive, you will eventually be on the C train in Calgary. And they would ride the C train up and down all day, up and down all day, eventually to run into this person. That's the kind of desperation that's there. And so we say, don't go back. And she went back thinking he was at work, hid into the closet, came up behind her while she was getting her things, knocked her in the, in the back of the head with a rock and she passed away, she died. So this is a serious thing when we say, don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. Practice self-care. What do you need to do to feel good about yourself? Um, you know, meditation, prayer, going for a walk, listen to, like, find a way in this unsafe situation to really uh, infuse, and, and um, Rochelle talked about this differently, a different message, a different internal dialogue. Change the internal dialogue that's there and stay connected. Um, isolation is pretty critical. A lot of people who experience violence are, they feel ashamed, but keep in mind, it's not your shame. It's not your shame, but they feel ashamed. They don't wanna to talk to anybody. I think especially, excuse me, people that are in faith communities, and we see that happen at the organization that I work at, it's, we see about 60% of our clients are Muslims, not because, and I want to say that, not because this happened in Muslim communities more. It's because there's a sense the Muslim community is more tightly knit, and so the women are more isolated. But uh, this is one of the characteristics of abusive relationship, and it's exacerbated by COVID. I'm going to run on very quickly because I'm at 30 minutes. How do you rebuild? One of the things that I have noticed is that women are incredibly strong. And despite all that they go through and still they rise. I've seen women with broken collarbones, ruptured spleen, broken ribs, uh, uh, black eyes, and I've seen them recover. 
I've seen them go on to um, the Academy of Arts here um, in Calgary, graduate and move on to be interior designers, regardless of what they have experienced and still I rise. Women are strong and it's important to know if you're in this situation that you are strong. If you were not strong, you would not have survived until now. The reality is you may not feel strong, he may tell you you're not strong, but if you were not strong, you would be gone. But despite the experience of so many women that have experienced this, women continue to rise. And it's so important to recognize that. One of the first things that women need to understand is that it's not their fault. It is critical to remember that this is not normal or healthy behavior. And oftentimes a male that uses violence uh, is a master at getting you to think it's your fault. If you didn't do this, if you didn't do that, that person's wife is better than you. And sometimes your children will even think that it's your fault. And it's easy to what I call chase your tail. So today, and, and my brothers, you that are on the line, I wanna say this, the men that are abusive are a tiny percentage, okay? We all have healthy husbands and brothers and uncles that are fine. I'm not talking about men in general. I'm just talking about this tiny percentage of men. And I don't, I don't wanna call them abusers, but men who use violence. But they're, those people who use violence are pretty good at getting you to think that it's your fault and you'll chase your tail. So today you get beaten up because uh, the, there was dishes in the sink, dishes in the sink. So tomorrow you clean the dishes in the sink. But then uh, the next day dinner wasn't ready. So you get beaten up because dinner wasn't ready. And I put that in cold because that's not the real reason, right? So the next day you uh, clean up the kitchen and you get dinner ready. When you come, when he comes home the next day, uh, the kids weren't quiet. So, and you just feel like you're consistently chasing your tail. And the reality is it's so important to realize that there's nothing you could do to cause this behavior. And there's nothing that you're going to be able to personally do to change this behavior. It's going to take an intervention to be able to do this. Um, I heard a story once. It's also important to tell somebody. I heard a story once and I wanna share this very quickly. Let me see the time I have. I'm gonna share this very quickly um, because this was a conference that I went and it was a religious conference. It was a church conference. And uh, there was a speaker that was speaking in the day and he said something that was um, upsetting to me, if I can say that. He was teaching about relationships and he said, most of the time, it is the woman that is antagonizing and provoking this behavior. And I could see the whole room turn and look at me because people are like, you cannot let this go, Joy. You have to say something. And, you know, it's very rude to interject speakers. You know, I, I just knew that. But I thought, I am sure there's somebody in this room that's in this situation. And I just can't let that statement go. I just can't let that statement go. And so I put up my hand and I, wasn't, I didn't want to be confrontational, but I said to them, you know, I have seen women who were chopped up. I've seen women who um, they were chopped with an ax and they had ax mark on their hands. I've seen women who had their head pushed through walls. I've seen women, uh, you know, with hip problems who he just twisted off her, her hips so it would be out of joint. I've seen women who had stitches from one ear to the other. Um, could you just help me to understand what she could possibly have done to provoke that kind of violence? And you could hear the crickets in the room. But I thought it was important because there's nothing anybody could do to provoke that level of violence. And I just, even though I, you know, I, I thought it's kind of rude to interject, I just felt like I couldn't allow that public statement to go with women who are experiencing violence and, and for them to sit back and, 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 and feel like there is something I'm doing wrong. And I, and I know people will disagree with this and it's fine, I'm just learning, people don't have to agree with this, but it is, it is hard for me to, I've never come across a situation where honestly the person was provoking it. What we've seen is 
he's abusive in this relationship and he leaves this one and he's abusive in the next one and he leaves that one, he's abusive in the next one. Really important for people to get some help in regards to this. Tell somebody, tell someone. It's difficult to recover from violence when you're still being abused and isolation. Tell someone, domestic violence thrives in secrecy and it's not your shame. Tell a friend, tell a family member. Some people may not know how to respond, but you will need support in this time. You really need to tell someone. Also ensure a stable environment. I'm not encouraging anyone to get a divorce. I'm not even encouraging anyone to leave. That's not the work that I do. But what I am encouraging is that you ensure yourself and your children's safety at any cost. That's what I'm encouraging. Ensure, do whatever you need to do to stabilize your safety, whatever that may be. And if you feel you cannot be safe in your own home, then you need to govern yourselves accordingly. So I'm sure some of them may have some questions about that, but I'm saying do what you need to do to ensure your safety. Also, it's really important to get some counseling, professional help. I don't recommend couples counseling when physical violence is involved. I don't recommend it. And the reason I don't recommend it is I've seen things go sideways when that happens. She says something in the counseling session that he didn't want her to say, and she gets beaten up for it when she gets home. I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen where she, they, she actually got beaten up in the parking lot after they left the counseling session. They didn't even get home. So there needs to be safety before you can do couples counseling because otherwise you're not even gonna get a good sense of what's going on. You're not even gonna have a good sense. I'm gonna run on very quickly here. Acknowledge the truth of your experience. It's really important to recognize that this is abuse. This is really happening to you. It's gonna be very difficult to acknowledge this. It's easier to just say, you know, this is not abuse, he's having a bad day. People may feel shame. How could I have put up with this? Why did this happen to me? If I was a person of faith, people may experience a faith crisis. I prayed, I fasted, I did everything that I could. I did all the right things and nothing changed. There is a tendency to minimize the extent of the abuse and, and it's, this is a coping mechanism. It is a coping mechanism. And then uh, Rochelle talked a little bit about that is to rewrite your internal dialogue. I don't have a lot of time to spend because I realize um, this is happening. You may say, but I still love him. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with still loving them, uh, but love your children more. Love yourself more until he chooses to behave differently. I was on the plane from Taiwan to Hong Kong with a woman from Africa and she was a, a judge in, in, uh, in uh, Nigeria and she d did um, domestic violence cases. And she said she told one woman before him, pray for him, but pray for him from afar. <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. Uh, but change the internal dialogue. You didn't do anything to provoke this. You didn't do anything to be ashamed of this. All the negative things you've come to believe. Ask yourself the question, when did I start believing this? What did I believe about myself before I was in this relationship? Whose report do you actually believe? If you're a person of faith and he says you're ugly or, or stupid or whatever, you know, what does, your, what does your faith scripture says? In Christianity, it's beautified you with salvation. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, if he says you're worth nothing, think about what you're, what you're worth to yourself, to your children. I'm gonna run on because uh, it's important for us to get through this. I know there's somebody else coming after me. You're a survivor and it takes great strength to survive an abusive relationship. Look at all that you've been through and you are still here. And now, after everything, now I rise. After all that you have been through, all the person has been through and now now I rise. Thank you. If you're looking for places to call, where to go, I think this should be in your handout also. Oh. 
Just always keep in mind you're not alone. Thank you.